Hi, this is Dr. Richard Ruling here to welcome you on the Total Health Channel. Please uh, welcome uh, your friends and share with them. Uh, invite them to like the uh, channel as well so that they get a notice of it. Let's ask God's blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, please help us in what we have to share today that we can see it clearly and reflect it to others well. We ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to see things as you intend from your word and to do exceeding abundantly for Christ's sake. Uh, we thank you for your rich promises and provisions in his name. Amen. The title for today is how the General Conference SDAs are missing or blind to Ellen White's definition of the church. Her definition in Prophets and Kings, really the title was changed from the captivity and restoration of Israel in which God says, Lo, the days come, and I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, and cause them to return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall possess it. This chapter, uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 3, is just one chapter before the new covenant promise in chapter 31. And the context is latter day. Uh, and it says at that time, same time, verse 1, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, and that... Uh, gather them from the north country, the, the coast, the lame, the blind, the woman with child, a great company will return there. And that's how we get the, in verse 31, he will make a new covenant and write his law in our hearts. My focus is that we are not ready to go to heaven until that happens. We, we, uh, heaven, we might cause trouble in heaven again. And the whole universe is looking on to see a final generation that can somehow uh, lived through a time of trouble such as never was, and like Daniel and his friends, uh, not dishonor God, but be willing to face death if need be. And if we uh, would prefer to die than to dishonor God, uh, I think we can make it. But that's how, we've got to have the new covenant promise written in our heart to do that. And uh, the context is going to the Middle East. That's uh, <laughs> You can't get out of the context uh, in fact, in Ezekiel 36, verse 24, it says, I'll gather you out of all nations, bring you into your own land, sprinkle clean water on you, put my spirit in you, cause you to walk in my statutes and judgments, and you'll dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. Uh, that's uh, an essential ingredient uh, in, I believe it's Isaiah 61 or 62, uh, verse 4 or 5, Beulah land means married land. Uh, God will marry the land with his people. Uh, in a suzerain treaty, when a king married a bride, in a secondary sense, he married the village, the land, the people, etc. So uh, that's that's how it, it will be biblically in the end time. And what I want is to share a a um, rags to riches story that we we need that. And uh, you know, 25 years ago, I read this article on how to get rich, and most of them wouldn't work, but uh, marriage will, and we can marry the bridegroom. And he has the riches, and his provision for us will be adequate. But we just need to see that and see what he wants from us. Basically, it's uh, it's not uh, that complicated. The Luke 12 wedding parable is like a Rosetta Stone. It helps de uh, decipher the other two wedding parables. If we put them all together, they make a greater sense. All three wedding parables teach us or imply that there's a sudden event beyond which we cannot get ready. It's too late. We've got to be ready at that time. And uh, the event is a calamity. Uh, Ellen White's last uh, uh, chapter of Christ's Object Lessons on the Ten Virgins, page 412, says, uh, As the earnest voice of midnight caught two groups unawares, one was ready, one was not, so now a sudden unlooked for calamity. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there's any real faith in the promises of God. I don't just understand fully how that is, that we will be face to face with death. It could be martial law. Now, living in this city, uh, may be taken to a FEMA camp or something. This is why I think we should get out of the cities. Uh, a, a huge event is coming when um, it will forever change our world. Uh, another statement by Ellen White is Prophets and Kings 626. Christians should be preparing for what is to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. And this uh, preparation they should make by diligently studying the Word of God and striving to conform their lives to its precepts. I don't think God intended us to live in the cities. The first murderer, Cain, made the first city. And the sign to get out of the cities was one you see an abomination standing where it ought not. 
That's what le uh, led the early Christians to flee Jerusalem when Cestius, the Roman general, came and he was outside the city. We invited the Pope uh, to stand in Congress. He ought not to be there. He represents a system of abominations in uh, Revelation 17, verse 5. So, you know, time to get out of the cities. Uh, sorry, it's not about money anymore. Uh, money will soon be worthless anyway. Um, make plans, make provisions, uh, take a drive out in the country, find some spot you can think you might rent, etc., if need be. Uh, I think that the martial law will be in the cities, but probably not in the countries. So having said that, uh, what else does God want from us? The wedding parables show that he wants us watching. In Luke 12, 36, uh, we're to be like men who wait for the Lord when he comes from the wedding and knocks, that he, we may open immediately. The knock is an earthquake, probably, because that's the only other place where Christ knocks in the New Testament is Revelation 3.20 for a lukewarm church that ended in an earthquake. That's uh, historic, 63 A.D. So knock might be big. you know. In fact, the day of the Lord that uh, is the end time period is initiated with a huge earthquake. It's uh, in Isaiah 2, verse 12 and 21. Day of the Lord will be upon all the proud, and verse 21 says the Lord will arise to shake terribly the earth. Uh, the New King James says he will shake the earth mightily. So uh, I think everybody's going to know. It's, it will give probably the, the first angel's message, fear God, give glory to him. Time of his judgment, or crisis, the Greek word is crisis, spelled with a K, is come. So uh, I think... Uh, we just need to give that message so people will understand that this is God shaking the world and time to conform, repent of what we're doing and seek his ways. And uh, Luke 12, 36 says that when I come and knock, you open immediately. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord finds watching. When he comes, he will gird himself and make him sit down to eat and serve him. Well, that's the imagery from the Last Supper. And so it has Passover imagery. The uh, idea of watching is also Passover. We can't be awake every night. The word, Greek word for watch is Gregorio, be awake. But, and that's how Christ used it uh, his last night. He asked his disciples, watch with me. Couldn't you watch one hour? Be awake. Well, I think he wants us to be seeking him and uh, celebrating the Passover as, as we should. It was a time when they ate the lamb. We don't have to eat lamb physically, but reviewing the closing scenes of the lamb's life, what he did for us, the whipping he bore, took and his being crucified for us I, I think it prepares us spiritually and then if he knocks we're ready uh, we're not afraid uh, whatever the situation may be so having said that um, let's uh, look forward to that event when if we open uh, there's a wedding feast uh, and the wedding feast in, in Matthew 22 the king sends his servants to bid people to a wedding feast but it's scorned and ridiculed the wedding feast of Passover is unleavened bread. And, of course, that doesn't sound like a wedding feast. It's uh, who wants <laughs> crackers. <laughs> Not very good. But uh, in this case, if we realize in Matthew 16, verse 12, Christ said, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, their teachings. We should beware of the teachings of churches, church groups. They've leavened the bread. And they say, oh, you don't need to do Passover. Uh, and we can do communion whenever we want, uh, you know, uh, uh, weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever. Why not on the very night that Christ did it? I like Ellen White's take on this. Desire of Ages, page 652, second paragraph. As he, Christ, ate the, the uh, Passover with his disciples, he instituted in its place the service that was to be the memorial of his great sacrifice. We should celebrate the Lord's Supper on the eve of Passover. Or more specifically, second Passover, I think, because his clues point to second Passover in the second month. Like the days of Noah, the flood came with Passover timing, but second spring month. And again, when five women missed the wedding, he said, watch, you don't understand. It's like a man traveling to a far country. Travel, uh, that provision in Numbers 9, verse 10 and 11, allowed for them to keep Passover a month later if they had been gone on a trip and couldn't get back in time for Passover. So uh, we're not excused. Passover was time of judgment. We're not excused from judgment. But we can keep it the second month because, in, in a sense, those provisions in Numbers 9-11 apply to us in a spiritual sense. Uh, 
one of them was if you had contact with a dead body, and Noah had contact with Methuselah, who died as a sign the flood was coming. He had to bury him. Lamech, his son, had already died. Noah was the grandson. He buried his grandfather, whose name meant at his death it will come. Okay, the flood came. And so um, there was a, a delay one month for the flood. It came in the second month. And the other provision is for a long journey. And uh, in a spiritual sense, we've all had contact with a dead body, and we've been in a long journey towards truth. Uh, it's kind of a zigzag course. You accept this, you learn this, and uh, we don't get it from the church. These topics aren't discussed in church. It's just Jesus is going to save you, and how is he going to do that if we don't uh, study what he said? So uh, please... Um, consider these things. I'm seeing that the unleavened bread that we eat is spiritual topics, topics that have emphasized seven times in, in the Bible as a mark of end time truth. One of them is the hiding place, going to Israel. Seven times God uh, told Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. And in Galatians 3.29, Paul says, if you're Christ, you're Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So Christians should have opportunity to go to Israel just as much as Jews do. It's our land just as much as theirs. And I believe God's going to uh, get rid of those uh, irreligious people that don't care about their spiritual heritage. And then it'll take real faith to go back. But I believe God will prepare the way for us. So that's just an example of the seven topics. I have a book, uh, The Earthquake and Seven Seals, that fit the uh, contextually the, the seals from Revelation 6. The uh, first seal is uh, when... John hears thunder, it reminds us that in John, John chapter 12, verse 28 and 29, Christ prayed, Father, glorify your name. And the people standing around him thought it thundered. So thunder is linked to God's name, and we see that again in Revelation 14, 1 and 2, when the 144,000 have the Father's name in their forehead, and the next verse says there were thunderings and lightnings and so on. So, all in all, there are topics we need to consider for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We've done this before. Uh, I don't really don't know uh, exactly. I hate to repeat a lot of things, but if you have topics you would like to have dis discussed, this can become a forum. Ask the question in the uh, response below, and uh, we can discuss it. Um, could discuss some health topics, too. Uh, I have a health seminar series, but don't know technically how to put it on here on the video. So... Um, won't do that unless somebody speaks up and tells me how we can do that from a PowerPoint. So thank you very much. God bless you. Uh, look forward to uh, sharing again and to your questions or uh, topics that you would like to have discussed. Thank you.